thank you guys uh, so much uh, for coming out tonight for our first panel discussion as part of STEM at Stack. So nice to see everyone. I see a number of our faculty members here, of course. Uh, I see some of our alum. I see a lot of our employees, but most of all, I see our students. That's what it's all about. So give yourselves a round of applause. I know some of you are actually in my class, so thank you for coming out. Uh, and I've been told uh, by the provost to say that anyone who has homework due, make sure you submit it before the end of the semester, right? I know some of you are getting uh, credit. But a big thank you for coming out. We're really excited about tonight's uh, panel discussion, uh, the first in a, a series. I did want to make a few special introductions. Uh, we have a lot of our student athletes here who are succeeding both uh, on the courts and in the classroom, so thank you. I know our women's basketball team couldn't be here because they're in the middle of the game right now. Nicole tells me battling for first place, so we're gonna give them a, a shout out. But uh, speaking of athletics, we do have a Hall of Famer here with us. We have Hall of Fame goaltender from the New York Rangers, uh, Mike Richter. Mike, uh, please. Uh, President of uh, Bright Core Energy, and he's kindly agreed to come back and do a stack chat with all of you. So you'll be hearing more of that. Mike, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us again. <laughs> we have one other Hall of Famer with us that uh, you may not know as well as Mike, but he's another big Ranger guy as well. Bob Cattell uh, has agreed to moderate tonight's panel. Uh, Bob and I go back about 35 years. Uh, when I was your age, and Bob was probably my age, uh, we started together uh, in the energy industry. Bob was the CEO of Brooklyn Union Gas Company, Keyspan, later National Grid, and to this very day is still leading now in clean energy, wind and technology, all the things we need for the future. The only thing that Bob is more passionate about than energy is actually Students, Bob is the chair of Crystal Ray High School in Brooklyn. They'll be here next month. They were here last summer. And Bob is also the chair of our STEM advisory board, so he's the one making all of this possible for all of you. But I will turn it to Bob shortly, but wanted to up front just recognize you, Bob, and thank you for coming out. Okay, I promise I will keep my remarks brief because I really do want you to hear from the panel. But I'll speak both as a former member of the energy industry for 30 years, but more so now uh, as the president of the next generation of sustainable leaders, all of you. And I can tell you, when I reflect back on my 30 years in the energy industry, the only bad days I ever had were caused by climate change. It was real. It is real. I remember hurricanes Irene and Lee, and I never heard of those, devastating upstate New York. Superstorm Sandy, I know you remember that one. Devastating downstate New York. I used to travel as far away as Puerto Rico regularly with a team of 100 workers to try to bring the power back to the people. So I saw the devastation. But honestly, I had so many better days than the tough days. My best days when we were part of the solution. I remember vividly building the first ever community solar for a low-income neighborhood in western New York. I remember building a smart grid, as I'm sure Carlos will tell you, in the eastern part of New York. I remember going to dairy farms and connecting them, using cow manure, if you can imagine, to create electricity on the grid. I remember connecting gas plants, waste treatment plants, right into our gas system. Maybe my favorite project of all was geothermal. I don't know if you know what that is, but Use the sun as solar, and you drill down 250 feet, where it's a constant 50, 55 degrees, and use the earth as your battery. So, so many days we were part of the solution. Tonight we're going to have a conversation around what I call the energy trilemma, a challenge with three aspects. First is making sure that energy is affordable, that everyone can have access to it, similar to education. Second is reliable. The lights need to be on. The heat needs to flow. But third and finally now at the forefront is sustainability. How do we ensure that it's clean, that it's green, that it's carbon free, that it's net zero as we move forward? This is the issue of our time. And for the students, you saw my note today, 
It's the issue, the defining issue of your time. The good news is you will be the solution. Right? Just the same way you order Uber or you buy your food or you download a video, you're going to help us figure out how to solve that energy challenge. Let me give you the classic example. Let's say right now you want to do your laundry and the utility says it will cost you $20 to do a load of wash. But they said if you wait three hours until after the peak, Instead of you paying them $20, they would pay you $20. How many of you would wait for three hours? Right? That's the future. Making decisions that are good for the grid and good for the customers. I encourage you, don't just think of the supply, the wind and the solar. Think of the demand. We will add a lot more renewables, 50% at least in the next generation. But if demand goes up, 60% will have taken a backwards step. We need to suppress the demand. If you look back at history, every time societies had a challenge, it was the next generation that helped to solve it. Whether it was the advent of electricity, the automobile, personal computers, dare I say, the phone itself, it's been your generations, the next generation, that solve the problem. Climate change is a problem, and sustainability is the solution. You are the solution. I ask you tonight, participate in this discussion and help us solve it together. So with that, now it really is my honor to turn the paddle over to our moderator, Mr. Bob Cattell. Please give Bob a round of applause. Well, thank you, Ken, uh, for those. You know, I, you notice I'm old, so I'm sitting down. My first hand like the young guy. But no, thank you for those nice remarks. Uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, I'm a guy who spent most of my entire career, my entire career, in the energy utility business, starting with a small utility in Brooklyn, eventually being acquired by a large international company called National Grid. <clears throat> I have always had a passion for working with young people, and the reason I have a passion for that is I was very fortunate. I was able to get a good education at City College, when uh, City College was tuition free, believe it or not. I couldn't have gone to college without. Uh, without that opportunity. And that education really gave me a platform to achieve whatever success I've been able to achieve in life. So I am very gratified, I guess, to work with young people today to give them the same opportunity that I had. <clears throat> but as Ken said, you know, you, you folks are our future. As we look at the energy industry today, it's going through tremendous transformation. And we're in, we always wanted to keep the lights on and made sure that it was affordable the challenge today is to do it in a more clean, sustainable manner and still make it, as Ken said, reliable and affordable. And that's what you're going to hear about from some of our panelists tonight. We're really fortunate. We have a great group here with expertise in the area. We're going to give them an opportunity to talk a little bit, but then we want to open it up to you and hear what questions you have. Because again, as Ken said, you're the future. You're the ones that are going to really make the difference going forward. So this is really your session and even much more than ours. So let me take a, a minute now to <clears throat> introduce our panelists. Uh, right next to me is uh, Carlos Noel. Carlos is Vice President of Transformation Programs at National Grid. Carlos is responsible for enabling the transformation of the electric distribution business through multi-year investments in areas such as advanced metering and grid modernization functionality. Carlos is an MBA from Holt International Business School and a BS in Industrial Engineering from Andres Bellos Catholic University in Venezuela. He also earned the Advanced Certificate in exec for Executives in Management, Innovation and Technology from MIT, Sloan School of Business. Carlos currently sits on the Board of Directors for the Design Lighting Consortium, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to drive efficient lighting by defining quality facilitating through thought leadership and delivering tools and resources to the lighting market through open dialogue and collaboration. That's quite a description. I'm going to introduce all of the panelists, and then I'll turn it over to them. Next, we have Samir Renati. Samir is a climate justice advisor for the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Samir advised New York's Climate Action Council on the inclusion of climate justice principles in their recently completed scoping plan on achieving New York's required goal to build a thriving carbon neutral economy by 2050. Samir holds an MBA from University of Washington. His professional background includes stints as a U.S. Staff Senate Assistant, White House CEQ intern, 
senatorial and presidential level election campaign organizer, and extensive advocacy work for 10 different clean energy environmental nonprofits. His expertise is at the intersection of social, economic, and climate policy. And last but not least, we have Caitlin Zungoli. Caitlin is, a, Caitlin is a senior specialist for Con Edison's e-mobility. Caitlin started with Con Edison's subsidiary, Origin Rockland, which actually serves this area, in 2018 as an analyst in the financial services group and became a senior advisor in 2021. He has really important stuff. Caitlin earned her undergraduate degree here at St. Thomas Aquinas with a major in finance and a minor in mathematics. So she's one of your own. In 2021, she completed her Master of Business Administration at New York University, specializing in business, analytics, and strategy. In addition to these specializations, she took several classes in sustainable business at NYU. Caitlin is also the Vice President of St. Thomas Aquinas' College's Alumni Board and actively volunteers with the group to support the college and its students. They were all very active at our stack meeting uh, that we had earlier. And uh, now, without further ado, because you really want to hear from them, and then we want to hear from you, I'll turn first to Carlos. And I'll give him the microphone. Sure. Um, so good evening, and thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. Um, so first of all, I just need to point out Ken uh, being so proud of his phone. And hopefully some of you notice that he still has a BlackBerry keyboard at the bottom. <laughs> that is something I'll never forget. He's probably one of the few individuals in the world that actually has that, and he's still proud of it. Um, you know, I um, I always tell people when I when I tell them that I work for a utility company, it was like, really, that's that's really boring. You couldn't find a better job than working for a utility. And yeah, well, pretty much. Um, but the reality is, I actually have the pleasure to work in all the cool stuff. And you know, the the biggest thing I have young kids, and my kids always think that I'm, what I do is boring. But I actually ended up in YouTube, and I ended up doing a podcast. And you know, it's interesting, like you see how the younger generations actually care about climate change. And to me, the biggest change I've seen in the you know, 10, 20 years that I've done this work is that actually people now care. And they care for a multitude of reasons. Uh, when I interview people, one of the biggest reasons why people like you want to have a job at National Grid is because they actually can make a difference. They can make a difference not just in the job they're doing, but actually for the broader society. And I get the pleasure to actually work with all the cool things that are necessary to make sure that that future happens. Right, um, you know, Ken talked about the EVs and some of geothermal. You know, the electric system is really old. It's really, really old. Um, we still have distribution lines that were pretty much invented 100 years ago, or built 100 years ago. Right, it's not a new system. So imagine that that system that was designed in one way by engineers now has to do a bunch of things that no one ever thought were possible. No one thought that a car could run electricity rather than gasoline or that your home would be heated instead of wood or oil, it would be heated by electricity. And you know, all those things need to happen to make sure that we can get to this transition. And a lot of what my team gets to do is try all those things and figure out what are the problems we're gonna have and try to solve them ahead of time so we can actually keep serving those customers in a reliable way. Um, you know, for many of you thinking about an electric vehicle, it's probably something that's not that foreign. But early on, when we started talking about EVs, it was like a weird concept, but people were saying, why, why would you do this? But in reality, if you think about this, where we are in this transition, we're, we're making a shift that is probably as equally important as going from horses to vehicles, gasoline vehicles. Now you're going to electric vehicles, and you know that means that the electric wires you see every single day, like the ones outside, are not just gonna be for your home, they're actually gonna be like a gas station. So, you know, being in the energy space today, it's one of those really exciting sectors because you actually get to do things that are going to change society completely. Um, and I always tell people, it's not about just the engineering part of it. My team is full with people that do data and analytics, they do business modeling, we have people that do marketing, we have people that do computer work, web design, so this, this industry is changing because people, customers like you and I, really didn't care much about energy before. Like just for reference, customers only think about energy nine minutes a year, nine minutes. And you wanna guess what those nine minutes are for? Anyone wanna take a guess how much, like why they spend that time on? 
I won't say outages, that's part of it. What's the second one? Pay the electric bill. The only two times that I actually didn't care about us. But the reality is now, um, actually today, I had the opportunity to sit with some of our call center reps. And when you hear some of the calls, people are calling because they want to know how they make their homes more efficient. They want to know how they get a charging station in their home. They want to know what it takes to put solar panels in their home. So the conversation on how to engage customers <clears throat> is changing drastically. And what that means for a business like a utility is that you're not just there to provide power, you're there to engage with customers and give them the best products that actually make sense for them. So we're switching from just a business where no one thinks about us to a business where you actually have to be in a selling mode because you actually want to sell them energy solutions. So it is, you know, it's a big transition and it is a really good opportunity for people to kind of be part of this journey. And we need, we need part of the reason why I'm here you say, do truly believe what Bob was saying. We need a lot of leaders and really smart people to make this happen over the next few years. And we're looking for schools like this one to kind of be part of this transition because without it, we don't we don't have a fighting chance. So. Thank you. Turn it over to Caitlin next. Hi, everybody. Uh, I was in your shoes, <laughs> I'd like to think, not too long ago, class of 2015. Um, so I just wanted to share to get us started that my interest in electric vehicles kind of stemmed from back in 03, 04, when my dad purchased a Honda Civic Hybrid. Ooh, exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, right? That's when the Prius came out, everything. Those were the years. Um, and, you know, then starting in college, it felt like I could become a teacher, a doctor, that was quickly out of the question. <laughs> Um, or my mom was in accounting, so I was going to be an accountant. Ended up switching into finance. Um, but you never think about what you can couple, what you end up going into and majoring in with what your interests are. So I thought when my dad bought the hybrid, this is so cool. This is the future. Now we have electric vehicles, and that's what I'm working with day in and day out. And even though I have a finance background, I was able to sell my skill set in analytics to be able to pivot from knowing nothing about sustainability to then being able to speak to how I can analyze the market and provide feedback within our group. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to pass it over to Samir. Great. Thank you. I have a booming voice, so I guess I'll be over here. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm grateful for all of your interest um, in this um, important um, issue. Um, my motivation really is to make the world a better place. It's always been something that's driven me since I was a kid, and we'll get more into this in the questions, but I'd encourage everyone to think about a career in, in public service. Um, I work at NYSERDA, which is a public authority. It functions as an agency of the executive branch. Um, its mission um, is to invest in building an inclusive clean energy economy. Uh, the president of NYSERDA and the commissioner of New York's Department of Environmental Conservation together co-chaired New York's 22-member Climate Action Council that I was brought on uh, to advise in the task of completing their scoping plan, particularly uh, the justice implications. And that scoping plan is how New York State can achieve the climate targets that are mandated by our um, New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which I call the Climate Act for short. Um, so the scoping plan came out in late December. It is truly a tremendous accomplishment for our whole state. It, it covers numerous policies and strategies to tackle climate change and pollution in a justice-oriented, holistic fashion that really improves the quality of life of every New Yorker. That, that must be the intent by um, surmounting long-standing barriers to um, decision-making processes and access to knowledge and opportunities for everyone to prosper in the new green economy that we will be building. And, you know, in a nutshell, my job is to effectuate the plan's justice objectives uh, through fostering greater uh, coordination, collaboration, and engagement. Okay, now it's time to uh, open it up to you for questions. I have some questions to ask the panel, but before I do that, let's turn to the audience. I think we have a couple of people in the audience. Want to kick this off? 
Who's going to go first? Okay. Raise her hand first. You raise your hand. Please stand up. Shy, but I saw it. <laughs> Which one? There? No. Go ahead. Please stand up. So I had a question. You said that the system it's it's old, right? Like it's it needs to be updated. What would it take to basically completely overhaul it and update it? Because the thing is, although everything's old, everything's outdated, and to overhaul it with like a new system, and even preferably like what sourced system? Because there's also there's solar, there's the geothermal. Like what would be the one to possibly overhaul it with and update it with? Um, so it's a good question, and I don't think there is one thing, to be honest with you. I think there is a combination of things that need to happen. Um, you know, when I, when I started to do this work, solar was extremely expensive and almost impossible for people to afford it. Right now, solar, it's still expensive, but it's significantly cheaper for people to do it, and I think solar is going to play a role, but solar has limitations. It only works during certain hours, and in New England, unfortunately, we get a lot of snow, and it gets dark really early, so that becomes a problem. Uh, wind, it's a big solution, it's a big part of the solution. And, you know, whether it's offshore wind, or whether it's onshore wind, like in New York, there's a lot of opportunities to do a lot more than that. But as Ken said, that is the generation part of the equation. And that's, to be honest with you, that's the easiest part of it, because th those are new things that we're building. The tougher part of it, it's actually getting people to be more efficient. And that starts in our homes, to make our homes more efficient, right? Um, you know, I always tell people, one of the biggest changes I've seen in the industry is that people actually pay attention to energy now, and not because energy has become like a bigger thing, but it's actually, energy has become a sexy part of our industry. Like, I always tell people, how many of you know about what Nest is? Anyone knows what Nest is, a Nest thermostat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would have guessed that if I would have asked about a Nest thermostat five, 10 years ago, no one would have known what that is. And the Nest thermostat is something, it's a regular thermostat where you actually can, it has an app on your phone, you can control it remotely. And all those things actually make our homes more efficient because you can control, like I'm not home and I can lower the temperature. That is a big part of the equation to get that system. So, you know, you need to start going by different pieces, both on the generation side, but also on the demand side, to try to make the homes and the businesses more efficient. Um, the last thing I would say is, businesses are taking real action to make a difference. I, um, I was talking to Walmart. Uh, obviously, Walmart has some big facilities. They use a lot of energy. And they're realizing that their customers are demanding. It's not because it makes sense for them. Their customers are demanding them to be greener and to be more efficient. That's a good thing. Because that means that those stores are using a lot less energy every single day, which then helps us to compensate because we're getting cleaner generation and people are using less. That's the easiest way to get to the future. Otherwise, it just becomes impossible to pay for. I'll, I'll just add transmission too. We significantly, not just in New York State, but the whole country really, to really connect all of the renewables. Um, we, we need to significantly build that out. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for your time today, uh, first of all. And uh, second of all, my question, how has, the, how has the energy industry changed in the time that, you, that you've been in it and secondly, where do you where do you foresee it going with all this chatter about it in the next ten years? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one example, which is really simple in real life. Um, ten years ago, I, I went to a, this big board executive meeting, and I talked about EVs, and I wanted a, we wanted to put a hundred charging stations across our service territory, and people were looking at me like I had two heads, I'm like, why, why would you want to put charging stations? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I will say five years after that, I went to a similar meeting, and I said I want to put charging stations, and I was asking for something like $50 million for 10,000 charging stations. And the question I got from a CFO, which is your financial guy, which normally says do not spend money, right. like, is that enough? Should we be asking for $100 million? <laughs> So I think as an industry, people are realizing the value because there's a greater demand. There's more people that want to have electric vehicles, more people want to have solar. That's translated to the fact that people realize that we need to change as an industry. So I think that's being a big shift from a cultural perspective. People realize how important that is. Um, where do I see this going? Um, you know, I, I think technology will continue to operate. I actually had the opportunity to be in Australia a couple of months ago for work. 
And just to give you a sense, more than half of the houses in Australia have solar today. So just think about it, right? That means that the amount of generation that is coming from houses is just gonna be massive. And that means that, you know, you're gonna be essentially a seller of electricity to the grid at some point. And that's gonna, you know, create some new things and you're gonna charge your vehicle from your own solar panels and have a battery. That is what the future is gonna be. But that future is not, <coughs> Like I would say five years ago, that future was far-fetched. Today, I'd say that's gonna happen for sure. And there's gonna be new technologies with smart people that might be in this same room that are gonna keep changing this, this world. Like, you know, batteries have evolved a lot, and I'm sure they're gonna keep evolving, but when you see other countries that are far ahead than us, that's what the future looks like for us. It's solar panels everywhere, batteries everywhere, and electric vehicles everywhere. Carlos's point, I just got the certificate that I've been at Con Ed for five years. Things have changed so much in just that five years that I've been there. It went from, we were talking about it, it was renewing the energy vision was the name of the program, to now the energy efficiency, the electric vehicle departments are all the hot departments to want to work for because we're a more nimble aspect of the company, and I know you're probably like utility nimble, what, no. <laughs> so, you know, it's, even just in the five years alone that I've been there, there's so many topics introduced to me that I haven't thought about, to your point, with solar panels charging your own vehicle, like, that's a microgrid. What is that? I never heard of that before, but things like this have just been hot topics, along with the fact that a lot of the legislation I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Inflation Reduction Act. It really should have just been called, hey, we have a climate problem, we need to fix this. Because a significant portion of the money that the government is sourcing and funding is for these renewable initiatives that the utilities have a responsibility for at the end of the day. So this is a high in demand future part of our entire system that's only just begun. It's only five years old. Probably a little bit more than that, but five year time span. Um, since, since I began as an environmental advocate in 2009, I mean, I've seen the use of coal significantly decline. I've seen uh, solar energy uh, costs like beat projections. It's, it's become cheaper um, than, than people are projected. Um, and this is probably a good chance to share what is required to be achieved in the future. In the state of New York, by, by 2030, 70% of our electricity has to come from renewable sources. By 2040, um, the electricity, all the all electricity we consume has to be zero emissions. Uh, President Biden has a zero emissions target for, for the whole country for 2035, which hopefully the Inflation Reduction Act will achieve. That's gonna be a little bit harder. EPA will need to step in, but um, you know, I, I continue, I, I continue to foresee a renewable energy and efficiency um, increasing and, and dirty fuels decreasing. Does that answer your question? Maybe I can add just a little bit of that because I can guarantee I've been in the utility business longer than anybody in this room. But what I've seen, what I've seen is more change for the benefit in the last five years than the 40 years before that. And change is happening more rapidly all the time. A lot of that's being driven by technology. If you think about, you know, you probably heard this example, everybody points to the iPhones that we all have today. You know, 20 years ago, none of us had these capabilities. You had the old rotary phones that you used. None of you remember rotary phones. So I think the thing that's driving a lot of it, and that's one of the reasons I stay involved, is to see the new technology. And technologies are continually improving. And just to get it, one of the things Carlos said, one of the places where you can have the biggest impact in this is on your own home. But just improving the efficiency, when you think about it, if you improve the efficiency in your home, you lose less energy, you need less generation, so it's really probably one of the best places to have an impact individually. Question. Um, obviously a huge part of sustainability is the expenses of it, and I think the costs oftentimes, like on a large scale and small scale aspects, can deter a lot of people from being more sustainable and making those choices. Are any of your companies or agencies doing anything to kind of take that financial burden off lower income families and people who can't really afford right now to like make those switches even though they want to? So I can, I can go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
So just for reference, so we spend, we spend roughly $700 million in energy efficiency every year. $700 million, the big, big number. Um, the bulk of that money goes to incentives for customers to actually overcome that barrier that we talked about. 30% um, of that total $700 million actually is completely allocated to communities with what we call environmental justice communities. So those are communities that primarily have customers that they are in financial hardship. And what it means for those customers is, if you want to actually get and do insulation in your home, which is, you know, make sure your house is airtight, we cover the entire cost of that project. We are doing a project right now because that was one of the things we discovered is that that was not enough. When we went to a house and we tried to do insulation, we realized that they had a leaky roof or they had asbestos in their roof. We, we saw the same thing with that community solar that Ken was talking about. Everyone wants to put solar, but if you have a, a roof that is falling apart, you cannot put solar. So we actually just came up with a program that actually helps with money from NYSERDA, with money from the state, to actually help the customers make those repairs so then they can do all the energy efficiency work. So there's a lot of resources that are available and you know, people don't realize how much is available until we kind of go or they check the utility website. But everyone helps to pay for those programs. It's in your bills. Everyone, every one of you that has to pay an electric bill or a gas bill, there's money that's going from your bill into those funds. So people need to take advantage. The money's there. The problem is, you know, I always tell my friends, the biggest job that we have, it's not the money. The money we have. It's just convincing people that the utility, which actually sells energy, it's telling them to use less. So that's like going to a Starbucks and instead of saying, don't get the large, get the small one. The small one is much better for you. And you know, when we do market research, one of the biggest things we hear is people believe that this is too good to be true. And they don't do it. They think it's a scam. But the reality is those programs are out there to help customers to do those enhancements that are necessary for them to be more comfortable, but also to save money. I don't know if you want to talk from an EV perspective, for sure. So, not specifically on um, the costs, but our main target with the charging stations are to be in disadvantaged communities, because while they may not have the ability to afford them right now, our goal is to, what is it, 80 percent of cars sold by 2030 will have to be electric? 68 um, percent according to the zero emission vehicle standard, but the integration analysis, the scope of plan, of course, is 90. Okay. Which we need to get that. <laughs> There's a lot of numbers. Some days I'm like, oh, <laughs> which year is that goal? So, um, you know, at a certain point in time, you're not going to be able to purchase a gas car, and if these communities are the last to be hit with having these charging stations, they wouldn't be able to get it at all. You know, the funds wouldn't be there. So this is why they're our primary target um, from the beginning, because we don't want them to be underserved in the future. And then also a quick ask, if you guys could say your name before you ask questions, that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I could probably talk about this forever, so I'll just try to give you a concise answer. I, I think just starting at the high level, according to the um, in studies, in, in the scoping plan, the net benefits of New York taking action through 2050 will be um, estimated to be between 115 to $130 billion. That accounts for the climate and the health benefits alone. It does not incorporate the significant amount of jobs that would also be created. And so the, the key thing is to socialize this, to, to see how, um, you know, to have a thoughtful approach community by community so that we can um, go in and, and ensure that the economic development truly benefits the community. I mean, electric vehicles, once we build it out, electricity is cheaper than gasoline. The cost of pollution obviously improves people's health. And, and so it's, it, it's a matter of socializing it. One thing that you may be aware of in uh, the proposed budget that the uh, governor came out with, um, details are still kind of being worked out, but there's, she proposed an economy, or there's an economy-wide cap and invest program that also includes a rebate, an, an energy rebate that likely should erase um, any projected cost increases. And of course, fossil fuel prices are highly volatile too. And so there is a benefit to having more sustainable sources of energy in that regard. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Oops, a question in the back. Yeah, my, yeah, my name is Simon Young. I'm an MBA student. I'm a little older than most of them. And I've had experience in all three, and I have a question for all three of you. One, I have solar panels, and to my dismay, I just realized that it's now 90% is efficient. So obviously, the solar panels in my house are a depreciating asset, and I don't want to be sustainable. As far as the EVs, I personally believe um, in hydrogen, and I don't know what the position of state of hydrogen vehicles, I think hydrogen vehicles would be a much better alternative to EV, because again, we don't have a problem, we have a problem with dismantling the lithium batteries. As far as I assert them, I just, I had an air conditioning unit with an R22, which I felt was inefficient, I went to an ICERTA, certified with ICERTA, in order to get the rebates, we have to use your people. And so I got the local guy here did a wonderful job for $16,000 or $17,000. Then ICERTA certified person who's going to take the rebate was going to charge me $50,000. So when you do your ICERTA authorization, you're forcing people to deal with the people you tell them to deal with. And those people, I believe, take advantage of the rebate program rather than me being able to deal with a local person who does, did a wonderful job. But I can't take advantage of it. There's a $50,000 difference to a $16,000 difference. It's significant. Plus, they get the rebate. So they're making a fortune. So those are three experiences I've had uh, or, or queries I've had. Sure. Would you want to go with an assertive one? Yeah. You, you can okay, go sure. Well, I, I, I guess I'll start by saying we are rolling out uh, clean energy hubs are launching in every economic, regional economic development council of the state, um, which will help with the, that outreach and, and the contractors. I'm really sorry to hear about your situation, and, and it doesn't seem like that should be the case. So feel free to follow up with me, and I'll see what I can do to ensure that, you know, that, that that gets addressed. In regards to the use of hydrogen, there's all kinds of use cases that are still being evaluated, certainly for transportation in particular, long-haul trucking, very useful there. It could be used in, in, in light-duty and medium-duty applications. Obviously, with in regards to electric vehicles, we, we also need to have a sustainable EV economy and recycle the parts. And, and certainly there is the other thing of, we just need to use more public transportation and have other, you know, and like Con Ed is also electrifying non-light duty vehicles so we can have like vans and all these other things. So that's also part of the e equation. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I can't really, I also, my expertise is kind of limited in some capacity, so I don't know if I can answer your solar question, uh, okay, but, but okay. maybe maybe he can and then we can riff. Yeah, yeah so, um, so I'll start on the solar one. Um, you know, solar panels do degrade, right? So over time, their ability to produce electricity drops. Um, most reputable solar installers would take into account the degradation of solar panels to actually do the payback analysis. And I would say solar panels are expected to, to last at least 20 years and still be within 80% of their usage capacity. That is, again, that is roughly what we've seen. We, you know, we, we have, so I've done utility scale solar projects and you know, we've done them for 10 years and they're still producing probably upwards of 90% of their capacity, right? So, you know, there might be specific kind of vendors and requirements that are different. I do, I would say, I, Bob talked about, I'm part of our, an organization that it's responsible for setting standards on the lighting side. One of the things we we're talking at our board meeting recently is, you know, we need to probably start looking at standards on the solar side, because one of the things we're seeing is there's a, proliferation of solar providers, especially Chinese providers that are coming into the US, they tend to be cheaper in price, but they don't have the quality. So we started to get into reliability issues, capacity issues. So I'm not sure if that's specific to your case, but for the most part, what we've seen is that, you know, solar panels should last about 20 years and should degrade about 20% during that time frame. Just so sure. it's ending up being Tesla stuff. In order to get now a Tesla battery, mm -hmm. battery, which by the way, batteries for a house are about $15,000 in addition. Are. They are. So they're not cheap, and there's no subsidy on that. Tesla is forcing me to buy more solar panels so that I can get the batteries. So basically, I'm a Tesla grandfather, but they won't deal with me. 
is the arrogance of the uh, is the arrogance of uh, I guess for, not a massive monopoly. The arrogance of monopoly. They can do whatever they want and they just sit there in the chair laughing. Yeah. You know, Sixty year olds working there and they're laughing because they can say whatever they want and get away with it. I clear you, but they're not. They're saying you got to buy at least four thousand kilowatts minimum, and that's five six thousand dollars in order to be able to have the pleasure of buying a $15,000 warrior. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know the specifics. And I, and I own a Tesla, so I actually didn't, I mean, I, I'm not going to debate about their business practices. Um, <laughs> I, I like their cars. I think it's fine. It's, it's a good car. So, um, you know, I, I think for, for the battery piece, um, I know, for example, in Massachusetts, and I need to go back in New York, in upstate. Um, I know in Massachusetts, we actually do have an incentive, and that's probably going to become more common. To get to incentivize people to get solar and storage, and that actually has benefits in a couple of ways, right? So uh, we talked about kind of solar and how good it is. Solar actually can be a bit problematic at times, right? So think about the middle of the day when it's really sunny outside, and people are not home; they're all in their businesses, right? There is this effect called the dark curve, which means that. It's the oldest generation and there's not enough demand. So it's actually the opposite problem that most people would think. There's too much generation and not enough usage. And then suddenly a cloud goes by or it becomes dark and you lose all that generation in seconds, right? Having batteries allows you to compensate because you can then use some of that power from the solar panels and put them in a battery and actually use them when it starts to get cloudy or when it starts to get dark. So batteries are actually something that we want to incentivize for a whole host of reasons. Uh, I don't know about this specific area because National Grid does not serve this area, but I know in the areas that we serve, we, we are incentivizing solar plus storage as a solution. Um, you talked about hydrogen. Uh, we do believe hydrogen is a big part of it. Um, I think it's really early on to say which one is going to win, right? Um, electricity seems to be making a pretty compelling case, but so is hydrogen for a lot of you that are use cases. You talked about the trucking industry. So, you know, we're still early in the journey, and I think it's really dangerous for anyone to pick winners and losers. I think the solution, you asked me the question about what is the solution, and like what's, there's not one thing. Like this is a complex problem, it's a complex thing because the electric system has a lot of moving parts, and the solution actually, unfortunately, is a lot of the above because Hydrogen will work for certain things, and electricity will work for other things. And just, I think we need to be careful trying to pick the one that we think is the only solution. If I could just add one more thing. Um, you know, look at what happened with the Inflation Reduction Act. As soon as that went into play, Ford upped their prices of their vehicles because of the rebate, so they wanted to make more money. It's just, you're always going to have bad actors. You know, we're trying to do right by enacting these laws for climate change and corporations are going to be greedy at the end of the day. You know, it's plain and simple. Um, to also add, Carlos kind of took the words right out of my mouth there with um, hydrogen. You know, I said before, five years into my career with Con Edison, this is all still relatively new. The strategy team is trying to just figure out how to handle what we as a utility have been tasked with. And like I said before, utility, nimble, not synonymous. But now we have to be. So yes, we're giving consideration to hydrogen. Yes, we're thinking about electric, mainly because most of the vehicles that have the optionality for alternative fuel sources are electric. So we have to make do with what we have at this point in time, essentially. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time on this if we yeah. want to move along. <laughs> okay, we have time for a couple more questions. I see some more hands are going up. How about uh, right there. Hi, good evening. Everyone. Stand up and say who you are. Yeah. Okay, I'm very shy, so don't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Professor Angela McDonald. I'm the coordinator of the hospitality management here with the School of Business. I have one announcement to make, which is about the Earth Day and I'm here with my PR manager, Emily. <laughs> who is um, the uh, promotional public relations manager for the Earth Day event, which, we're being, which is being held on the 22nd of April. Okay. So we're looking forward to hosting all you guys in terms of energy, uh, sustainability, etc. 
and welcome you all on campus on the other day. You'll see lots more about it all over the place yeah. very, very soon. Just today we're working on a robot war, so we're hoping to be able to um, have a little bit of a bot war, perhaps on the lawn, with some help from my friends in STEM too. Anyway, that wasn't my question. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, so I'll start. I mean, I think it's funny. So I've done this work for, I would say, 10, 15 years, but I actually didn't start in the energy space. So people think that I'm like an energy gig and that's what I've done most of my life. I actually ended up, similar to her, I was in procurement, which is one of the most boring jobs you could ever have, uh, and I did it for a long time, to essentially going to, one day they said, we're doing this smart grid thing, and we need someone to go and run it, and I'm like, sure, I don't know what smart grid is, but I'll figure it out as I go. Um, and so the only reason why I bring it up is because, you know, don't think that to be in the energy space you have to be an expert at something, right? Within my team, there's people that do app data analytics. There's people that do design of like websites. There's people that do, you know, program management of like how do they engage with communities? How do they run programs? How do they run energy efficiency things? This project management, this finance. So, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is this is an industry that's growing quite a bit. And I think the biggest thing is people that have the passion, like having that passion and saying I really care about energy. And I might not be an engineer, but I actually can be a great PR person. I can have a path there. Um, I always tell people, um, kind of starting in companies like in the call center or customers, like you actually get to know the business quite a bit uh, and have, like things you can be translatable to other parts of the business. Um, so I don't think there's one, one thing that the industry needs. We just need people that actually want to be in the industry. Like, honest to God, we, we cannot keep up with hiring enough people. Like, it's just, we, we have a huge demand and not enough people. So the biggest thing is network with people that are in the industry, network with, go to events that are energy related, talk to people like me or any of us in the panel, uh, because that's, you know, in the industry we need all kinds of backgrounds to make it happen. If I could just add to, um you know, my experience with this sustainability kind of really started to take shape when I was at NYU. And prior to that, I didn't know, you could go to a company's website and look at their ESG report. How many of you guys know what ESG stands for? Okay. Environmental, social, and governance. So that's the first thing you wanna look for. If there are some things that resonate with you, maybe connect with one of the folks on LinkedIn from the company, start to look at what they post and what, sorry, I'm hearing like a little bit of feedback and I'm like, how far am I to stay away from the mic? Sorry. Um, look at what they post, see if it connects with you. And then while you're here at Stack, get really good at what you're majoring in. This way you can speak to your skill set and then just blanket apply it to how you think this can shape their ESG report, their ESG department, um, and just be really considerate and deliberate about what your studies are and what you want the outcomes to be as they relate to your interests in environment and sustainability. Yeah, and I would echo what the panelists have, have said, but just I'm glad you asked that question because I have, I have a bunch of handouts there for um, NYSERDA, you know, we have like, there's numerous internship job training programs. You can go to our workforce development website if you're really interested in like a technically focused career in clean energy. I would encourage all of you to think about getting a master's degree in public administration or business administration, both of them certainly in, in, the, in the energy field. Um, the way, you know, I really like engaging people, um, constituent um, services, stuff like that. So I didn't, uh, 
get into the energy field until a couple of years later after I began my career. I, I worked on several election campaigns. Most recently, um, in 2008, I worked for Obama, and it was such an emotionally intense, difficult campaign. I was like, yeah, you know, I really like this stuff, but I want to focus now on the climate energy side if I'm still going to be doing this. So I, then I latched my career onto that. Um, but, but I would say, if you can, maybe get a job as an organizer or volunteer on a, on a political campaign or some type of an outreach thing because the interpersonal skills that you will develop through that and the organizing skills through having to you know, engage a community in some fashion and meet a goal, I, I think that could be um, highly beneficial. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm sorry, I was yeah. going to ask one quick question for Caitlin because we have the unique opportunity to have someone who was literally here seven or eight years ago you give one thing to our current students that they should, like in your experience from where you were then to where you are now, what one thing, one piece of advice would you give them to get on that track? Not necessarily your job, but on that track for success. Don't be afraid to take risks. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Well, let's thank our panel. Great job.